The brothers wish. The brothers wish, brothers wish. The brothers wish. The brothers. You're now listening to Greg. Hey everybody, this is Greg Soul with the Brothers Wisps number 79. Uh, I am, again, Greg. I'm down here in the motherland, Texas. Tonight we've got Mikey, all the way from Chicagoland. How's it going, guys? Excellent. And maybe some of the other bums will pop in later. I don't know. We'll see. I'm not going to hold my breath. (laughs) It's, uh, it's, what is this, uh, Two days after Thanksgiving, so everybody's yeah. kind of all over the place. So I don't blame them. Uh, just the the dedicated few here uh, holding down the fort. So let's get uh, the uh, new patrons out of the way. So we do have uh, a Patreon, uh, Patreon.com forward slash The Brothers Wisp. If you join that, you get access to our Patreon only Slack. Tons of good discourse in there. I think we've got was it Mikey like fifty people in there, sixty people, something like that. Uh, I'll take a quick look. The general channel was shit out of everybody. Uh, there's been 74 people in general channel. All right, there you go. So it's a lot of good stuff all the time. You know what I really like too is a lot of uh, questions answered. So you can pop a question in there and then have like a live interactive conversation with somebody to solve it. And then you've got all these different people from different angles, different backgrounds, different use cases, all throwing their ideas in there. Um, very politely throwing their ideas in there. It's it's really it's a good it's a good place. But our new ones uh, for this round we have Colin McAllister, Jeff Martin, Lee Allen. Oh, I don't have my glasses on. Lee Alamand, uh, Andrew Kaiser, Steve Carter, and Brian Monday. So we've got quite a few new uh, soldiers in the ranks uh, this go around. So uh, you ready to jump in with some of the news, Mikey? Because I know sure. it's been. Uh, we skipped a uh, we skipped a cast, so uh, we've got a little bit of stuff backed up. First on the list is Ubiquity's doing zero percent financing now. What are your thoughts on that? It, uh, I I loved. I don't remember all the comments, obviously, that I saw when I posted that uh, that news, uh, but uh, some of what I saw, I thought I thought was pretty hilarious. Uh, some guys were saying, um, you know, making comments about their inability to keep things in stock. Um, so what good is 0% if you can't buy it in the first place? <laughs> um, no, it, um, and then of course, you know, there were some people talking about, you know, there's always someone to complain. Uh, usually it's me, but, um, you know, there was a, you know, $5,000 minimum, uh, I think they need to be in business for five years as well. Uh, I think I saw. Um, so, you know, they're not financing startups. They're yeah, financing. It says 0% APR offered is based on applicants' qualifications. So, yeah, there are some, there's a there's a vetting process. And it says yeah. it's 0% APR for 24 months. So you get two years uh, to pay it back with uh, no interest, which is not bad. Yeah, uh, and so, you know, there are obviously, you know, some downsides to it. Like, it's most likely going to be MSRP, and most places sell to you under MSRP. So can you get financing for some amount of percentage, whatever it is, and still pay less than this program? Right, right. With the interest going through a distributor that's going to give you a really good discount, actually save you money over paying MSRP with the, I see what you're saying. Yeah. It's interesting. And, and you know, I've, I've done nothing on the math on it, so maybe it is, maybe it's not. Um, but, uh, but, uh, I do see, so it must have a commercial location for equipment use. I guess it's to exclude people just buying stuff out of their house. But then I run my wisp out of my house, so um, <laughs> I guess I can't participate. Um, and then one thing I do see here is that it, it looks like um, if, which is what, one thing that can be tough for financing, um, is that it looks like they will look at your business credit, and if it's not sufficient, then they look at your personal credit because it says. Personal credit is also looked at if applicable. 
So it sounds like if they don't like what they see at just business, then they'll, you know, dig into your personal finances. Gotcha. Uh, but if not, it sounds like they'll they'll do it without. Um, and you know, I see this being real useful for or somebody else financing it for all I care um, in like the MSP type space, where it's like you know you can do this big build out, you can charge people X amount a month for like a managed infrastructure product. Um, now you don't have to worry about where you can get your money from to b- do this gigantic, you know, build out a school or build out a whatever, you know, you know, building out some office complex. If your intent is to charge per month for the access points, you know, now you don't need to figure out where you're going to get, you know, you know, pay for all of it up front. Yeah, fair enough. I uh, guess it's uh, more or less the easy button is what you're saying, as opposed to going out and finding your own financing and doing all that you might be able to find this a little bit simpler sure sure yeah uh and you know maybe i'll just have to look sometime and see you know talk to brian over at Baltic and be like hey you know i know you like i believe they're partnered with somebody that does financing uh you know just tell them, hey i i don't want to buy it but just you know what would it look like price wise just so i can compare how useful this ubiquity finance program is yeah for sure for sure uh, sounds interesting it uh I would hope for the distributor's case that the ubiquity program is worse because like, because it's like, means like, you know, you build a channel and then you compete yeah. with your channel. Yeah. Well, so I mean, if you're, if you're truly, if you're honestly and truly competing with the manufacturer, you're, you're never going to win. Right. Because they're making it so they can set the price, whatever they want. Um, so yeah, there has to be some detriment, some downside to it. Yet, uh, but, um, but I do believe historically the Ubiquity store has been MSRP, so I think that's kind of where, you know, if the finance guys don't take too much money, uh, you know, hopefully they'll still make it out yeah, so ahead. And even if nobody really takes advantage of this, it was uh, one more thing that the marketing department could push out, you know, because, like, our marketing guys are always looking for anything to start doing media blasts about. So, you know, just... Sure. Drums up buzz, you know, yeah, get a few new faces looking at you. Uh, maybe investors get a little bit more excited about it uh, due to, you know, just the extra hype. I get it. I see what they're doing there. I see you. All right. So let's go from Ubiquity over to Microtick. The newsletter 85 came out, which actually was a minute ago. Um, it was new as of when we should have done the last cast. So it's, it's a little bit old, but... Um, there's a couple of new devices. I think this had already been announced. The CRS305 1G 4S plus IN. Uh, it's basically a uh, four port 10 gig switch that's got a copper gig port on it, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, uh, and it's 150 bucks. Yeah, yeah, it's list price. It's got two uh, DC inputs on the back as well. So dual power, and then it's also got PoEN on that copper port. So you theoretically could maybe have three different points of power on this thing. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, Microtech once again has proven how cheap it can be to build an SFP enabled product. Um, like, you know, my, you know, the, the core of my issue is that, you know, it, it's not expensive to add SFPs to devices if, you know, their one gig version of this is, I think, fifty bucks. Yeah. You know, so you know, if it, you know, if the MSRP and a product has five SFPs on it, is fifty bucks. Then it can't be that much to add it. You know, cost to add it to an existing product. You know, to another product. You know, here we have four SFP pluses in a product that's one hundred and fifty. If your licensed, you know, backhaul radio can do more than one gig. Stop with this lag stuff. Stop with giving me a whole bunch of one gig ports because it just makes it more complicated. Just put a 10 gig port on it because obviously they're not that expensive. If, if the whole product is 150, you know, one, 149, um, and a license backhaul is going to be thousands of dollars. So, um, yeah, they're saying this little guy, uh, maximum power consumption is 18 watts. 
So I'm wondering, I'm guessing these SFP plus slots, you could probably slide in regular SFPs. I, I think you could do that in a lot of their equipment. I'm not going to say that definitively. I'm not sure, but you probably sure. can. So you could probably bring in the 10 gig and then bop out one gigs from it if you wanted to. So it'd, it'd make a really nice kind of pop device, you know, if you just didn't need a lot of density and or you're just trying to do the layer two transport there, I can see it being extremely useful. I can actually think of a couple of different places where it would be useful for me. Um, and I like the form factor. It's not necessarily rack mountable, but it's very compact. So you could throw this thing on a shelf, you could screw it to a wall. Uh, it gives you a lot of options. It, uh, and I see that they they talk about it being dual boot, and I have I've only met one person ever that liked Switch OS. That's so true. why? Yeah. Why do they continue to do that's the it? First, that, that's the thing I thought. Yeah, it just it, it confounds me why they bother with the dual boot stuff uh, on the it, the on anything really. Nobody likes the Switch OS. Um, it uh, on their original products, like on the original, like the what was it the RB two hundred and fifty, which was the first one that that uh, had the Switch OS. I think it was their first one that would do line rates, anything, because I don't think they had, you know, hardware switching functional yet in router OS. So the first ones I get, but now that you can do line rate switching in router OS, why? Yeah. <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, scroll down a little bit, and you see they also have the LHG LTE kit. Uh, it's basically a 17 DVI LTE antenna. So uh, they're saying speeds of up to 150 megs by 50 megs. So really, this is kind of your rural. I bet this would work too. Like if you're in the middle of a building and you just you can't really get reception, I bet you could strap one of these in there, and uh, it would do sure. the trick. So, sure, yeah, considering that like most cell phones have a functional equivalent of zero or negative dB of gain because it's a very low gain antenna inside of a device. Yeah, seventeen dB is going to be a lot of gain. <laughs> um, it's just unfortunate that they don't support. Uh, you know, they have a, a really small band support. Yeah. Um, Supports I, international LTE. That doesn't mean anything for us, right? Uh, no, LTE not, bands uh, two, four, five, and twelve. Yeah, the, and you know, in my previous Microtech LTE rants, I've I, I've mentioned that like all of these bands are part of other bands. Why didn't they support the whole thing? Why is it like you know, it's like well, it's like their five gig stuff. You know, they don't do DFS, but they'll do all the other five gig. Why don't you just support all the five? You know, I mean, five gig at least. You know, it's a little more complicated because they have to develop the DFS functionality in router OS, but yeah. here it's like, why didn't you just do the whole thing? Why'd you, why'd you half ass it? But <laughs> this will be a very, but yeah, this will be a very popular product. Um, for sure. For sure. All right. So moving right along, uh, while we're talking about Microtech, they've announced the U S mom and it's going to be in Austin, Texas, man, that's in my backyard. And I actually, uh, went on, you know, the Microtech and logged in and I voted for Austin. So I am super glad, uh, that they're doing it there. Wait, April wait, 4th and 5th. Wait, what are you talking about voting for? Yeah. You could vote for the city that you wanted the next mom in. Where? When? Well, it's too what? late now, obviously, but uh, obviously, but I, 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 <laughs> I've never heard of this. Where's it set? Like on the forum, or is it in like, or is it in like the special trainers section or I think something? It's just or... when you log in, I think it popped up and asked you, like when you logged into your account. I can't huh. remember 100. percent But yeah, it's gonna be in uh, Austin. It's gonna be a good time. I love going to Austin. I know a lot of fun spots, uh, so I think it'll be really cool to hang out down there. Plus, man, depending on where it's at, it's like an hour and a half drive for me. So. Super stoked about that one. It, uh, I was like, I'm, I'm so blown away. That, that, like, I've, I've never, I've never heard about voting for this is that, and I'm complaining about their choices all the time, and no one's ever told me <laughs> that I could go vote for for where where it actually well, as is. As far as I know, this was the first year. So, um, oh okay, yeah, okay. I don't know. We'll give it a give it a go next go around. Uh, it's in the Austin Marriott South. It's on thirty five. Uh, if it's off of 35 and it's south, yeah, that's probably not too bad. 
That's going to be probably pretty close to downtown. And uh, I'm zooming out from OpenStreetMap, so that's their default link. Yeah, it's not too, yeah, like it's just, uh, do you know where 71 is? Nah. Or or 290? Yeah, I know where 290 is. It looks like it's just south of 290 and 35. Or wait, no, 290 is 35 there. Just, as I don't know. Yeah, they crisscross. It's just a little bit south of, of downtown. All right, cool. That'll be really close to all the good stuff. Uh, let's see. Miller had a birthday. Everybody say happy birthday to that kid. Um, something else that happened in the news. IBM acquired Red Hat. So I know I'm a big CentOS fan. Uh, so I have no idea what that means for people like me. Uh, I'm assuming this really doesn't mean anything for the next, what, four or five years? Yet, uh, well, you know, CentOS takes forever. Well, you know, Red Hat Enterprise takes forever to do anything anyway. So even if they change something now, you wouldn't notice it for years. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, um, I... I don't think it, like I don't view it as badly as say Oracle buying Sun, which owned Java and MySQL. Like I don't look at it that badly because there's not like a existing competing product really. I mean IBM has stuff, but you know they're not in the you know you know they're not in the community with the Linux distribution. So. Uh, I've got Maybe a couple just of friends looking that to monetize. work for a couple of the teams for Red Hat, you know, like on the um, consulting teams and stuff like that, or proof of concept teams. I wonder what it means for them. Uh, I hear it's not always uh, sunny working for IBM, you know, very corporate overlord infrastructure sort of thing. And Red Hat, from, from my understanding there, it is like super open. Um, they uh, treat their employees really well, uh, very loosey goosey sort of thing. They apparently have like this one big email distribution list that anybody in the company at any point in time can send an email that everybody else sees, right? And it goes up to the top to the bottom, and there's like discourse on everything, which I think is pretty cool. But I wonder if that's, that kind of stuff is going to stay. That's interesting, because uh, that could be potentially very dangerous. Yeah. Well, yeah. Some uh. people say it's very annoying. Uh, you know, but, uh, you filter that stuff out and ignore it if you want. But I just, I thought that was cool that, you know, the, the lowest guy on the totem pole can send an email that the CEO will see, you know, and, yeah, and possibly yeah. react to if it, you know, has enough discussion. I think that's, uh, fairly unique from what I understand. It, uh, looks like in 2017, they made 2.9 billion, um, and uh, Red Hat, that is, and IBM continues, in my opinion, not that I follow them a whole lot, but they continue to decrease in relevance. So, I would imagine that, oh, somebody makes money, let's buy them real yeah. quick. Before, well, I know probably, I don't know, nine years ago in the data center, we had, I don't know, probably twenty percent of the equipment in there was IBM, you know. So the IBM guys were in and out pretty frequently. And I would say now maybe maybe 0.5% of the equipment is IBM. It's basically been purged from every you know, like every cage in our data center. Nobody uses IBM, like hardware-wise anymore. And I know they're, they're bigger on what, like the managed services and stuff like that, but I really don't know but, uh... if any of our people inside really use them either, though. It uh, they must be because they have three hundred and sixty six thousand employees as of twenty seventeen. That's crazy. So there's a lot of IBMers doing something. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not the guy to talk to about that stuff, but it's interesting. Um, what does it, it mean uh, for the for the community it, as a whole? Uh, Who knows? And then looking here, it looks like Red Hat had LibreOffice, OpenStack, um. No, so there's there's a whole bunch of things other than just Red Hat Linux that that they did, um, but I you know I imagine most of it has to do with trying to get more into you know Linux managed services yeah. stuff. Yeah. What I assume. Well, I mean, you see with acquisitions as well. Sometimes they'll take the parts they want and sell off the parts they don't. So it doesn't mean it's going to stay intact the way it is now. They could just. You know, if there's redundancies, 
you know, we already have a department that does this or that. They might just let those people go, which sucks. Uh, for them. Sure, like, uh, like, uh, with like, uh, when, uh, Brocade, or, I guess Broadcom bought, bought Brocade, and, like, they end up selling all of the manufacturing, basically. They just bought them to get their intellectual property, and then it's like, you know, they spun out, you know, data center switches to extreme, and, you know, business switches in, and, and, and Ruckus to Eris. And they spun something else out to, was it Viata? They spun out to at and It's like they just sold off every piece of brocade other than their intellectual property. Mm. Other than just the handful of pieces they wanted. At, uh, which begs the question, why don't they, they just buy the, you know, why don't just buy the IP and leave the rest of it alone? <laughs> I don't know. All right. Well, while we're talking about acquisitions, Airspan Networks Incorporated just acquired mimosa networks incorporated well i say just that was what was that like four or five days ago uh i'm is that what the announcement was i'm not sure i think so i it was around there i heard about it before but yeah but uh um so airspan is traditionally no, like um 4g 5g manufacturer right yeah uh so i remember several years ago they were coming to the whisper shows you know pushing their I think at the time their 700 megahertz product, uh, 700 megahertz like WiMAX. Um, this is how long ago that was um, when that was a thing, and um, and then they uh, they kind of disappeared from the Wispa space. Then all of a sudden they started popping up, doing a lot of uh, small cell stuff. Um, like uh, I think they're powering most of Sprint small cells. Uh, so we'll. I'm not sure who else is using them, but you know they're doing a lot of that kind of stuff. So I I, I did see that uh, Airspan uh, and Mimosa had a partnership several years ago on some special device. Hmm. So it 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 kind of makes sense that you know they're you know that you know they picked them up, um, you know, because they were, already had a working relationship. And it sounds from what I've been hearing out of Mimosa, it sounds like it's largely going to be business as usual with more resources. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, they, so that's, from the from the from one of the press releases, they're saying something about, you know, they're keeping the distribution chains. They like the way all that stuff's going. Um, they like all the partnerships that Mimosa has made thus far. Uh, it says they're going to, you know, just overnight double their portfolio, you know, a whole new market to sell to, which makes sense, you know. Sure, sure, and you know, I'm guessing they probably didn't make a whole lot of inroads on the initial Wisp push, um, and you know that could be also part of the you know now there's all of this calf money out there, people having to build stuff, so maybe Airspan's trying to be, hey, you know, we've got some LTE stuff, we've got this other Mosa stuff, we you know, you know, trying to be more things to more people. Yeah. Well, I mean, I also know, uh, you know, if. If you've never heard of Airspan and they're trying to send you or sell you some equipment, um, it's going to be a lot harder than if Mimosa just rolls out a new piece of gear. You know what I mean? So they could yeah. just rebrand some of their kit as Mimosa, and then it's a name you know and trust, and you know you've been using their kit for a while, and it just rolls right into your portfolio. Yeah, I can, I can definitely see sure. how that works. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, and you know others do something similar. Um, IgniteNet and EdgeCore. You know, IgniteNet switches are EdgeCore hardware. Um, because they're they're owned by the same company. Hmm. Uh, Acton uh, owns you know owns both. So IgniteNet switches are just edge core switches with, and from what I understand, the OS is basically the same. Other than IgniteNet has spun out, you know, adding all this cloud connectivity stuff, and you know, kind of you know customize it a bit for their niche. But if edge core try to sell the Wisps, nobody knows what the hell that is. But everybody knows IgniteNet, whether they can use them, you know, you know, use their, you know, main, you know, 60 gigahertz brand or not, you know, they, they know who they are. So, um, you know, that helps move some of their other, their other company switches. Yeah, makes sense. All right. So let's, I see you added a thing, but I actually had it deeper in the list. I, th- I just, we'll, we'll kind of roll it into that one. Um, <laughs> I pulled some stuff, which I, I love doing now is just, um, although it's kind of 
tedious because there's so much conversation sometimes. Uh, I go through the Slack, through the various channels, and just kind of pull stuff that looks interesting out. Um, and so let's see. Jeff was saying that Huawei, once they uh, actually developed some U.S. distribution, that it ended up raising the prices and stuck the documentation behind a paywall. So he wasn't necessarily happy about that. I guess they got more responsive in shipping things um, as opposed to it having to come all the way from China. I guess that's that's one of benefit, right, of actually having local distribution. But um, I think he said he can still purchase direct from China if he wants, you know, kind of the AliExpress, Alibaba route. Sure, yeah, you know, that makes sense. And I assume that most people on Alibaba, um, either it's used stuff or it's fell off a truck or something. I assume it's not <laughs> through official channels. Um <laughs> Well, I don't know. They, so, may, they may be less discriminating over in China. If it's, you know, a Chinese distributor that's purchasing it, you know, they might just give them a big, nice wholesale discount and not think about it. it uh, it's a but, big you country. Know, it, uh, from what I understand, or stood, uh, like, all the stuff that is behind the paywall now was out in the open before, but it was, like, bad. It was, like, bad English translation. It was just, you know, like, you know, ran you know, ran the manual through Google Translate mm -hmm. and said, okay, here you go. That's, and it sounds like the stuff in the paywall is... I think Huawei's been kind of notorious for that forever, right? Is somewhat questionable documentation. Well, no, see, like, on the original Huawei stuff, it was great documentation because it was just the Cisco documentation <laughs> find and replace Cisco for Huawei and call it a day. Yeah, yeah. Um, because they had the same errors. <laughs> like... The, you know, the same errors in the documentation in both sets. Mm -hmm. So it, it it was stolen documentation. <laughs> um, I wonder it was if they ever clear. missed any find and replace and it still said Cisco in there. <laughs> Maybe it's, so. uh, I'm sure it happened. I've actually heard that before. I've heard about um, uh, Huawei. Who was it? So it was HP bought, what was it, 3Com? Is that right? And 3Com so. had bought routing from uh, a partner company of Huawei. I can't remember the name of that company. But they were manufacturing line cards that you could literally take and shove into like a Cisco 6500 chassis. Like they would slide in. The color coding was the same. And even the pinout on the back, it would mate in to the board. That's how copy and paste the hardware was. Pretty. I don't know that the line cards would actually power up, but they, I mean... For all intents and purposes, they were the same line cards, which is crazy to me uh, that they could, you know, get away with that. But whatever. That's, uh, that's Yet, uh, above my payment. You know, I assume that somebody at the factory just stole the plans, went to a different factory, and said, so, okay, make this, only change the logo on it. Yeah, there you go. Oh, man, that's crazy. All right, so something else. I think you actually brought this one up, Mike. It was discussing running fiber along with copper and MDUs. So um, even if you're not going to use the fiber now, why not go ahead and run the 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 fiber right along with the copper, right? Wasn't that kind of – I'm trying to remember what the conversation was about. Is that it? Sure. Sure, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, my thing with MDUs is that I want to run copper because I want to do PoE to the in-home router. Right. Well, in-unit router. So I can so I can provide a service that nobody else can. No other service provider unless they're do also doing what I'm doing, but you know, which is not very popular or common, you know, no one else can reboot the in-unit router, you know, full power cycle. Um, and then, obviously, then, you know, no one else can also provide backup power to it unless they get everybody a UPS, which is, you know, scale is just a cost problem at that point. Um, so I wanted to run copper. And someone else was saying, you know, fiber, 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 you know, uh, I think it was Adam Bell, uh, he works with Justin uh, Miller. Um, I think he was saying that all the property guys, you know, they get all excited about fiber, regardless if they need it or not. Oh yeah, that's what. Well, marketing you know, that's what sounds great. I'm excited. Yeah. You know, you can tell them the same solution and to substitute copper for fiber, and they'll want the fiber one, despite being the same thing. Um, so he said, you know, the the uh, I forget the actual brand name of it, but but it, it's you know bend-in sensitive fiber that they 
you know, work with mm -hmm. is cheap. Uh, it was like 30 cents a foot. Um, it's like, so just run the fiber there because it costs more to go back. Oh yeah. Well, a lot ever. of times it's impossible <laughs> to go back, you know? Um, so just, you know, run the fiber with it. And then if, you know, at some point down the road, you know, you want to do fiber, you know, you have your copper there doing the POE thing, and you could use fiber to do the data at that point. So I guess the understanding yeah. is if you did actually go to the fiber, you'd transition to some kind of pond, not like a active Ethernet? Some people do one, some people do the other. Um, but, uh, you know, that's what the great thing about fiber is. That it's, it's, it's there, it's available, do what, you know, do what you want with it. You can figure it out at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you know, you know, doing a home run for the fiber in in MDU, you know, you're not having miles of extra fiber. It's just, you know, the few hundred feet back to the, the, the you know, closet. So even if I did pond, I'd probably still home run everything back to the closet, where then I have the splitter there. Yeah, yeah. All right. So moving right along, somebody brought up uh, the fact that they were getting ready to do the network for a customer and i can't remember if it was the the customer or the cabler or somebody or maybe he was the cabler i can't remember 100 percent. but basically the customer was convinced that they needed 10 gig to the desktop for a standard office environment uh, and they were sold on it that it had to be 10 gig and so we started musing over the fact that what kind of environment would actually need 10 gig and take advantage of it and i know um, I've seen it like, uh, when I've done the lynda.com stuff, like the producers, uh, like the production team, they all have 10 gig to their desktops, but I mean, they're doing heavy video editing like all day, every day. So, I mean, that absolutely makes sense to do it in that environment. I can't think of too many other environments where you'd really need that much throughput to the desk. And I guess, um, uh, my thinking was this customer was probably just sold on it so that the vendor could make a few extra bucks, right? On selling hardware. Yeah. I mean, uh, can you think of any other rationale why you'd want 10 gig? Have you, have you seen anybody else talking about 10 gig to the desktop? Um, I know of like some wisps that have done 10 gig to their desktop. No. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but not to everybody's desktop. Just, just to theirs. That way then they get, you know, the 10 gig speed test.net test on their computer. And, but no, that's, that's all I've heard is that, and then, you know, video editing and, you know, big GIS stuff and, you know, design, you know, engineering and video editing. I could see, I, I don't agree, but I'm not going to argue too much. Yeah. 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 But everything else, it's like, I mean, everything else, it's like, you're probably fine with 10 megs. <laughs> I mean, because it doesn't take a long time to open up a Word document. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so what? Well, I mean, you know, what's your this? your average Office user, you know, they're just pulling small files. You know, they're pulling email. They're not they're not doing anything intensive. It doesn't really matter. It's uh, it's uh, you know, I had one of my consulting clients before. Uh, if somebody had like, there was slowness issues. Uh, this one guy's thing was swap them out to a gig phone. I'm like, no, like th they're working with files that are under 10 megs, like a hundred megabits going through the phone is that is not the cause of their five minute bottleneck. There's some other bottleneck in the system. It's not the phone. Mm. So, you know, you know, it was just the default thing of, you know, if, there, if this problem exists, swap to a gig phone. It's like, you you're wasting time and you're wasting phones. Mm. Stop. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, I know it's, still do it's it. the, the disparity in price um, is pretty, is pretty slim these days as far as a hundred meg versus a gig, you know, there's not, there's not that big a difference. So yeah, it makes sense. But I, but if you have to change out 50 phones to get them all to gig or something like that, yeah, that does actually make a difference in price. So I get that. It, uh, it's a, well, and like, you know, like to me, like, it wasn't even the price thing. It was just like you are wasting troubleshooting time <laughs> with this because it's not related. Yeah, get, uh, get it is not going to fix the problem. Move on, and they swore it did, and it never did. Yeah. <laughs> it never did. Well, while we're talking about uh, speeds, 
we had somebody this rolls i mean this comes up probably every month and a half or so somebody was talking about um microtech uh b test you know bandwidth test results to uh routers and so we always say if you want to test test through the router don't actually do the bandwidth test to the router that you want you know to see what the throughput is right because the bandwidth test uses a single cpu and it's going to max that cpu out and then it'll stop throughput wise i think what's the consensus about tcp 250 megs that's on average about how much you can get before it maxes out one of the cpus um i think it depends on the platform because like years ago um i think it was six seventeen what i think was the you know latest stable like actually stable firmware at the or uh right at, at the time uh, but i had that on a couple x86 boxes and i knew i wasn't going to test the links to their maximum because of the you know overhead of b test but i just wanted to see what would happen and i got 30 gigs running b test from one box to the other hmm. um i had four uh i had four 10 gigs and the problem was that uh b test was on the same core as like ethernet and so it uh i could figure out how to you know you, you know do some sort of process affinity to move it to a different core so that i could fill it up but uh um, so I mean, you know, B test can do a lot. It just takes a lot of beef to make it happen. Uh, you know, that's one, you know, one dual socket Xeon to another. But um, but they, you know, they've been pushing for years to use this traffic generator tool. And I've I've tried it a couple of times. It's it's nowhere near as simple. It's complicated. It's like so I just I always resort back to B test. Yeah. It's like until they make traffic generator as simple as B test, I'm probably not going to use well, it. Well, most of the stuff I'm testing is pretty low throughput, so B test works just fine. Um, I have used traffic generator pretty successfully. Something I like about it is it lets you DDoS uh, people if you want. <laughs> you, can, you can just fire hose at somebody, so it's actually really good for that. Uh, <laughs> at the uh, uh, and I believe it 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 produces a lot more information and a lot more useful information. Um, then just this is how fast it went. Hmm. Um, and I would like that, but it's it's not just type in the IP address, you know, credentials, and you know, choose what direction you want the traffic to go. It's there's a whole lot more stuff, and so I say move on. <laughs> All right, let's see. Next topic was invalid packets in their microtick. Um, this could be. Uh, one of the things was runts, so that's packets that are smaller than 64 bytes. Technically, there should be no packets smaller than 64 bytes, so it'll drop that. Um, another one is if packets show up that aren't in the connection table, you know, and it's not um, a new connection, then uh, those are considered invalid. Also, you know, like um, if you're having a communication and one side closes the session and then packets continue to show up in that chain, those are going to be invalid. So um, it's not always the worst thing in the world. Uh, to see a few of those here or there, right? So say you have some asymmetric routing in your network, you might see it. You know, if you've got a lot of redundancy, you might see a few spurious ones kind of fly through. So it's not always the craziest, worst thing in the world. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it's, you know, I've always, you know, one of my top couple rules has always been just drop it valid packets. Just drop it and move on. Um, and, um, you know, only if we got out of the hand is that I ever dig into it any further yeah, i've never had any problems with it let's see thomas also noted uh in a different thread that modern versions of router os do mss adjustment directly in the ppp driver to allow pack to stay in the fast path so uh, apparently it used to create a mango rule automatically to do it and now it just does it directly in the driver so much more efficient than it used to be i can't remember <laughs> why that came up but it did, so there you go. It, uh, yeah, yeah. It, um, and you know, anytime you can keep something in in fast path, um, you know, the better. Um, obviously. All right. So I had somebody who was uh, using a CCR to terminate a couple thousand PPPOE clients. It was also doing natting, and it started choking 
whenever 20 to 30 clients would drop and reestablish at once. And the, the client said that um, this generally happens because their area has bad power. So a tower would just, you know, lose power eventually, or a neighborhood would lose power. So all those customers would go down and then reestablish. And then there started to be this just CPU spike and these cascading sort of failure in the microtick. And so the answer to that one was to uh, split out the natting from the PPPoE termination. And then everything just started working fine. Uh, I guess it was just a little bit too much load for it. Uh, I think it was a CCR 1036. So it is what it is. That, uh, and I see, like, I know there's a bunch of people that are doing this sort of, you know, thousands of sessions on one device, and I and I don't understand the logic behind it. Like, why are you passing a device that can do it to put all your eggs in one basket? Like, I, 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 guess- I understand... Because I've I've had this conversation multiple times with multiple people, um, and generally what I like to do is those PPPoE uh, servers, the concentrators. I like to distribute them throughout the network, right? So um, each tower could theoretically be a PPPoE concentrator right there. So that's it. That's what I do. Yeah. Every you know every session stops at the tower. Yeah, and it's not like you go and make wide sweeping changes to these things very often. So having them in place is fine, and it also distributes the load, right? So that local router is doing PPPoE termination. And generally in your radius, you can pass back an attribute that says, um, you know, set them to this rate limit. So not only is the PPPoE being terminated there, but the customer's rate limit is terminated all the way there towards the edge at the tower. So that router is only getting lightly loaded as opposed to just like you said, having all of that pullback to a single point and that joker having to do all of the queuing uh, all the termination, right? Because it's having to constantly maintain these sessions. Um, and that's going to be CPU intensive in certain scenarios like this. Um, you know, and if it's your border router, you're also going to be doing your NATing, and you're going to be doing your firewalling. You know, so it's just, that's a lot of load to put on a single device, wherein if you kind of uh, separate all that stuff out, you know, even if you have five towers doing concentration, uh, you could still have one radius server, right? That is, it's not changing sure. that at all. You know? Sure. Yeah. Like uh, you know, you know. I think, you know, radius, which is obviously very old, but then radius, and then you know, various types of automation, you know, through Unimus or whatever, um, you know, to me eliminates any usefulness from these mega concentrations. Like, just push it all out locally, because you, you have that centralized radius that you can make redundant. You know. And, you know, any other changes you need to make if to, like, the profile settings or whatever, you just do it in Unimus and it does it on all your routers. Oh, yeah. Like, I understand that there's more work, more things to touch, but you shouldn't have to touch anything like that anyway. Do it in Unimus once, just if you're doing it on your one concentrator. Like, or insert your... Yeah. Well, I know... You know, a mission tool of choice, so but... I had this conversation with Thomas one time, and uh, in his network, he has... I think he's got, like, five PPPoE concentrators. So it's not just one big one or one big one with a backup. He actually does it with several, and they do it in that... They do it in this specific way because um, they use a lot of micropop sites. So that micropop may only have, like, five users on it, right? And then that may daisy-chain to another one and then to another one, right? And so... Um, it could get a little complicated in there. So in lieu of that, he VPLS tunnels all of those connections back to, you know, the, the whichever one is regionally close and then it has a backup, you know. So he, so it's, it's sort of a compromise in between the two. And so I, I see why he does it. Um, but I think that's um, not a super common use case for most of the people, at least here in the States, right? Normally you have a tower that's going to service, you know, a good chunk of customers. And then that's going to then connect to another tower that's going to be a good chunk, as opposed to the kind of micro pop that he does. So, sure, think- it, uh, but you know that style is getting more common with you know because cause now I think Mimosa started kind of you know well obviously micro pop design was before that, but Mimosa yeah. came out with the micro pop product, and now others are doing micro pop product as well. Um, you know, Cambium is coming out with uh, on the roadmap. I saw like a a, a micro pop type product for the 
you know, 450 product line. Uh, is it so, you know, so this, this whole, which it makes sense because, you know, wisps need high SNR <laughs> to have a good stable network. So either you have monster antennas or move it closer, you know, and, or do both, I suppose. Mm. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, you know, um, and so, you know, like, you know, uh, Rory Conway, you know, he's got hundreds or thousands of, you know, you know, thousands of users out in Phoenix area. You, you know, Phoenix is probably easier to do micro pops than, you know, I'd say Mississippi because there's flat. no foliage. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, there's, uh, you know, it's just, you know, you only intend to service a few hundred yards or, or meters. And that's, this is all you intend on serving from this access point. And then you use 64 or, you know, or 60 or, 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 you know, 24 gig backhaul to wherever your, you know, your bandwidth is at. But, uh, you know, that makes really stable client connections because if you can't, with a 25 dB dish, overcome interference at a few hundred yards, um, you're probably not going <laughs> to overcome that interference with anything. No, so earlier you said SNR. What is that? Uh, signal to noise ratio. Um, how how much you can hear what you want to hear over things you don't want to hear. Right. It's like the concept um, of in a noisy room. If you scream at the guy next to you, he'll probably hear you, right? So your yeah. signal is louder yeah, the, than the noise around you. Yeah, it's, uh, well and then you know, you can kind of observe this if you go to a restaurant and you're there all night long. You know, early in the night. It's real easy to talk to the guy next to you or even three or four tables away at a normal voice, assuming there's no, you know, uh, you know, overhead music that's just drowning you out. But then as the restaurant fills up with people and everyone's having their little conversations, that you know, that builds the noise floor, so then you have to talk louder to to you know, your intended target. So then everybody does, you know, just runs away until the, you know, until the, you know, restaurant dies off at the end of the evening and now you can go back to talking at a normal volume. Hmm. Fair enough. Very simple. All right. Let's see. Um, Somebody else had um, packet loss on a disparate switch network. So they basically had a switch network in building A and say a switch network in building B and they were different sites connected over the internet and they did a micro tick EOIP tunnel and every time they brought up that EOIP tunnel between them, both networks started getting packet loss and everything kind of went to hell in a handbasket. Uh, my tips on troubleshooting that is Microtik EOIP tunnels. I've noticed before whenever I'm connecting uh, two Cisco switches together through an EOIP tunnel, for whatever reason, if you have STP on, on the EOIP tunnel, it freaks out the Microtik STP process. And so if you ever see just kind of this weird intermittent packet loss, um, watch the STP on either side of that micro tick on the Cisco devices because I'm willing to bet you'll see uh, one of those VLANs go into blocking state. And it may not be, so say you're sending 10 VLANs over there, VLAN, you know, one through five, maybe VLAN five will just shut down and then it'll come back and then it'll shut down. It'll come back, right? So it's it's not always the whole link going down. Sometimes it's just an individual VLAN. So... Uh, be on the lookout for that. That's bit me more than once before. I've seen that. It uh, and I wish there was. I wish Trill or SPB or one of those was more commonplace throughout hardware, so people would stop using STP. STP is garbage. <laughs> um, I, that's why they made these new protocols. I, it works um, in a lot of environments. I use it pretty but, successfully uh, most of the time. Not to say that I wouldn't prefer something better, but you know, it's uh, you know, I you know, I don't remember the quote and I don't remember the name of the person exactly, but it was someone who was involved with the development of STP said, "This sucks," <laughs> so we made this instead. Fair enough. Uh, but uh, you know, I mean, you know, it solved lots of problems lots of times, but when it but then it also causes lots of frustration. Um, and, 
there's better tools out there. They just don't always get incorporated into the platforms. You know, Microtech doesn't have trail support or VXLAN or SPB or insert anything that any of the myriad of, you know, technologies that's, that is better than SDP mm. or SDP or MSGP or any other variations of that. I don't know. It seems like Microtech's pushing more into the enterprise, you know, more and more, you know, with like um, the 4011s, you know, I guess because that feels more like a, an enterprise device than kind of a home router. I don't know. It, it just, it, you know, it's got an SFP plus interface. I don't see a lot of home users getting one of those. So it feels more enterprise to me. So it just seems like the more they push into enterprise, the more they'll start taking heed to those sorts of commentary, you know, like, Hey, give us the enterprise protocols to go along with it. And, uh, and I think, you know, I think, I think they've moved to, to newer chipsets or better chipsets that have support for this stuff built in. So they're not trying to do it all in software and some, you know, crappy Athros, you know, switch chip that was only meant to be in a home router. Um, and you know, they haven't developed all all the functionality yet, but you know they're, you know, all the tools are there now mm. where they can, and uh, you know, in these new CRSs and whatnot. Um, you know, I I believe uh, the you know, protocol of choice now is uh, VXLAN, um, and uh, I saw somebody post something the other day. I think I just shared it on Butler's Wisp past day or two. So, you know, some some presentation from Ripe where they were saying that uh, VXLAN is dead, and you know this is the new one. It's like we're still moving to VXLAN. Like like that's still so far away for us, and you're saying it's dead already. <laughs> uh, but you know there was some discord on that. You know, uh, but uh, you know whatever. Yeah, there's always something new, uh, newer, shinier, better, right? It's like yeah, it, uh, it's things that like. Stable. Yeah, so well, like, I guess on a, on a tangent here, you know, I've, you know, I've got switches that have 40 gig ports, um, and so I'm looking for 40 gig waves. They are a thing, and uh, you know, this one transport company said, you know, we really only want to sell tens and hundreds. Like, we usually sell 40s for the same price as we sell tens, even though I know the equipment, you know. It will do 40s, and it only uses you know four tenths of a hundred gig wave in the in the spectrum. Um, they sell you know you know we would rather just sell you a heavily discounted hundred gig than 40 gig. Well, I'd rather buy a, that too, but my switch doesn't take it. So now I have to go from buying a thousand dollar switch to a six thousand dollar switch just to be able to plug it in. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's what our vendors were telling us probably a year and a half, two years ago. We'll sell you a, a one, a ten, or a hundred. We don't really want to do forties anymore. Yet, uh, and so like, 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 I'm really starting to like as much as I don't like Cisco. I'm really starting to like these uh, Nexus 3064s. You know, they've got an assortment of forty gigs on them. You know, they have forty-eight ten gig ports on them, um, and you know, we can get them with the current iOS for like 900 bucks um and they have you know vpc and all those other things that you know vpc we can kind of do like a you know like a ghetto trill arrangement type stuff with it and it's like we could do all this stuff with it and it's 900 bucks and you know i'm looking at you know i want something just a little bit better than 10 you know I, you know i'm gonna buy a 10 and then fill it up and then now I have a problem uh so that, okay so how do i solve this well fiber store used to have this little device where you plug in some tens and some forties, and it spits out a hundred. You just put one on each side, and away you go. <laughs> well, the blog posts are still there, but the product is not. So, <laughs> so it's like, so now I'm looking at, you know, what's the cheapest way of getting to hundred gig now? And it's, you know, those switches are sixty five hundred bucks. Yeah. For while we're while we're talking yeah. about it, you were asking about a white box switch that can do a massive amount of ACLs, right? So this would be the same device, right? 100 gig plus massive ACL count. Um it it was different use cases, but it could, you know, you know, cuz 
on the one hand, I'm looking for something just to, just to move bits into a wavelength from one IX to the other. Uh, you know, trying to try to take some of the content we've been able to get in indie and kind of help some of these new IXs get started. Um, you know, kind of break some of that chicken or egg cycle. The the high ACL one I'm looking at for uh, to make a poor man's DDoS scrubber for you know doing transit services. You know, and people on you know I asked you on Nana. Of course, I got all kinds of responses of that were worthless. Um, <laughs> you know, they kept saying, "Well, you know, what you want is fast netmon or was it Andrus Soft? I forget what their product was right, right now. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, no, no, that like that, that's the other half of the solution. That is what identifies what packets need to be yeah, dropped. That's detection, but they don't do the dropping. They still just send it off to some other device to do it, and you know if you've got a real DDoS, so you know you've got hundreds of thousands of things you need to drop. Because I'm, you know, I'm trying to go beyond the just just do a you know black hole route, and you know completely DDoS. You know I want it to, you know, push into the switch, a you know drop this source IP to this destination IP import. I want that to be pushed into the switch. That's why I want hundreds of thousands of ACL entries. And I look and I see it supports 4,000. Well, that's not going to do me any good. <laughs> you, know, you know, DDoSes are much more than that. Um, and uh, so I'm still looking. It doesn't have to be a white box. It could be anything. Just some people were saying, you know, uh, that Cumulus can push it in you know, through their API or through BGP uh, flow spec, you know, into whatever hardware constraints the switch it's installed on has, mm. which brings me back to the switch, you know, find me a switch that can do that. And I'm not finding it, uh, at least not at levels I can afford. Well, I know sometimes too, um, some like Cisco kit has the ability to rob Peter to pay Paul. So, they come with like a, a default set of this is how many ACLs you can have, this is how many BGP peers, how many sessions, routes, blah, 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 blah. But then you can um, basically nullify some of those things, like if you don't give a crap about them, and then push those resources over to, say, ACLs. So the regular spec sheet may, I don't know if they'll always 100% identify that, uh, that ability to, okay. I mean, it's, it's not, it's probably not always ideal for most situations, but if you're really just, pushing packets from point A to point B in, in a switched environment and you're okay with, you know, stealing Q, all of your QoS resources and stuff, you know what I mean? Because you're probably not oh, sure. prioritizing VoIP traffic and stuff like that. And uh, Oh, sure, yeah. Like, like you know, you know, these switches I'm looking at, you know, I plug in upstreams and maybe some transports and whatnot and then, you know, my Microtech routers into the switch so that way I can, you know, do multiple routers, you know, on each session, you know, you know, you're building some redundancy there. So I'm not using the device for layer three anything. I, you know, I don't care that it does a million IPv4 routes. It's going to be used as a switch. So if I can take that million IPv4 routes and turn it into a, a million ACL entries, then that's the, the bam, sold. So be it. Because that's all I'm going to use it for. Yeah, for sure. All right. So if anybody has any suggestions for Mike, be sure to reach out. Let us know. Let's see. Uh, the next one sure. was somebody was talking about how do you terminate your T1s? And the way I've always terminated data T1s is using just a regular Cisco 2621, like a 1U rack mount device. They are a million years old at this point, but you just get a T1 card in there. I'm talking about a total cost of probably $30 for all of that on a bad day. That's $30. Bucks. Um, if anybody's interested, I'll whip together uh, just a basic config that you guys can copy and paste on because it's... I don't, I don't know any other more reliable or cheaper solution to do it. Because when you put one of those things in and, and they link up, they just run and run and run forever. Do you, sure. Do you have any team ones? Sure, left? yeah. The, yeah the, at, well, my WISP has never had a T1. My WISP has never had any, you know, old school connection of any kind like that. But my uh, consulting client with the CLEC, uh, they've got some... Uh, Actually, they have a, a pair of 2621s or 2651s now um, on you know on some T1s, just doing uh, SIGTRAN 
to SO7 translations. But um, I'm actually replacing them with 2811s. There you go. Um, which, because because the 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 DC 2621s are still expensive because there's less of them. Hmm. Uh, so the 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 DC 2811s weren't much more than the DC 2621s. So I just went that way, uh, you know, because it's a newer platform, newer yeah. iOS, you know, newer everything yeah. for not much difference in money. Yeah. And then uh, I think the 2800 if you're doing voice services, like the PVDMs and stuff like that, they're just more powerful, you know, all the, the digital signal processors and stuff than the 2600. But if you're just doing data, like if you're terminating oh, sure, the yeah. one, man, those 2600s are all you need. Yeah, uh, yet, uh, I've got in there doing, uh, so it'll have, well, actually, I got a whole bunch of, of, of the dual T1 cards because they were cheap. It's like, you know, I'll just buy a whole bunch. Uh, and then I got some uh, DSL cards. Uh, actually, I, I got my DSL cards from Australia. It was cheaper to buy, like, 15 of them from Australia than it was to buy 10 of them here. Huh. Um, because they were just, it, it was like $5 a card. Like, I'm guessing somebody in Australia just wholesale got rid of thousands of these things and there's one you know shipping was like 80 bucks instead of 10 but so i just ordered a bunch of the cards to make it worth you know worth the difference hmm. um and so i'm oh and then uh i got a couple with uh uh async ports on them too so my intent is i have this 2811 um some of them have t1s but, uh actually most of them won't but uh but they'll all have dsl cards they'll all have the, the you know async serial in them and then I get a DSL from the incumbent. Um, I use the async uh, serial to then do uh, console ports on everything that has a console port on it. So that then I have a way into my network, you know, or, you know, a way into this location that's completely off net. And I can get into a console to do whatever, you know, reboot whatever switch or router it is that's that's there um then you know some of the t1s also do some of that you know sig trans to ss7 translation but uh you know there's been ways of doing it but these are all in co so they have to be that was compliant and you know minus 48 volt dc and so just ended up being the cheapest way i found to do it they're about know, 250 bucks a pop for all that no it sounds like most it of it in it's, uh, most of it's in the cost of the 2011 DC, but whatever. Mm. Which Cisco built it so the power is on the same side as half of the ports. So it's like, and the power is all in the back on everything else. So we have actually have the first one we installed is actually in the rack backwards uh, to keep the power on the right, you know, <laughs> the back side of the rack. Yeah, it used, Cisco's usually don't, like, especially the older kit like that, it doesn't put out a lot of heat. So, um, you know, even putting it backwards, that's not that big a deal, honestly. Let's yeah. Let's see. Uh, the next and last one we had was Steve, I think, was trying to um, grab L2TP sessions going from his Microtik to uh, a specific client. He wanted to do policy-based routing, right, like violate the, the route table. And he was trying to mangle it uh, and put routing marks on it. It just wasn't working. Turns out you need to put that mangle on the output chain because anything sourced from the router, like I'm the router and I'm sending it to somebody that's leaving the output chain. He was doing it on the pre-routing chain, which it would never actually get seen because it leaves the router before. So pre-routing happens, all that stuff. And then somewhere in the juicy middle, output chain happens. So he moved those uh, marks over to the output chain and Bob's your uncle, and then he was good. Yeah, it, uh, and as complicated as it is, you know, Microtech always has packet flow diagrams. That's right. That show everything. Definitively, this is where this happens. Yeah. Uh, but be sure um, to look up the V6 packet flow diagram, which is different than all the previous ones. Yeah, it's a, and I, I think they do change occasionally, so it's good to refresh that from time to time. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, um, there were two questions that got answered, I think, 10 minutes apart, and they both had uh, everything to do with the V6 packet flow diagram. 
like, hey, this thing happens in this order. That's why this thing is important or why this thing's, yeah. So it's, it's definitely, if you ever can't figure something out, uh, one, ask it in the Slack to check the V6 or <laughs> maybe check the V6 diagram first and then ask in the Slack. Maybe that's the simpler answer. Sure. All right, Mikey, uh, we've hit the hour mark. You have anything uh, monumental you need to discuss? Um, so I'm going to call him out on the Slack just to kind of pressure him to do what I'm looking for. Uh, so I sent an email over to Brian at Baltic. You know, uh, at the Whisper Show, you know, we did the you know, 411 versus CCR. Oh, yeah. Uh, to see, you know, what would load tables faster. Um, well, now there's all kinds of other, like, you know, that was just a real quick and dirty thing. I'm looking to uh, go to Baltic someday and do much more comprehensive tests. You know, lots of sessions and, you know, you know how many sessions can we load up on the 411 before it dies because it doesn't have a lot of RAM. And, you know, try to vet some of these, you know, what can you do on a CCR with BGP and what can't you do? Um, you know, before it falls on its face. And um, so I'm kind of looking to see what sort of, you know, seek some input from people, you know, what kind of tests they want to see, what kind of hardware they want to see tested. Um, it's reasonable. Somebody suggested testing some map lights, and <laughs> they don't hold a full table. So, no. <laughs> they, hold hard. They, they hold almost nothing. I think something interesting is when I made that BGP lab, something I found is is routers that when they run out of RAM, they just stop loading the table. So they have some kind of hidden protection mechanism built into them now so that before, because I remember before I used to play this game where I would turn it up on like a RB150, the full table, and it would just crash and burn and it would reboot and then come up, crash, burn, reboot. And now they've actually put in a protection mechanism where if BGP gets too big and it's consuming too much RAM, it just stops loading the table right there and then the router will keep passing packets so at least they've they've done that much so you can you can i guess you could see how many uh routes a map light would hold before it just stops but it's not <laughs> i mean it's not gonna really do you a lot of good yet uh but yeah so you know i'm thinking put it's what people want to see i'm hoping that i can just you know one day just go over there and just set everything up and do all these tests in one day you know do some screen recordings do some video um, and, uh, you know, kind of put some, some substance behind, you know, claims made about broader West and BGP, um, for, for everybody, you know, I make claims too. Right. With, Trying to put something very scientific but, together, right? Where you, it's reproducible results in the same environment. And yeah. So you can say apples to apples. This is how everything loads. Yeah. That's definitely, um, I, I smell what you're cooking. That, uh, so yeah, input, send it, <laughs> send it. All right. Let's see. Um, Mikey, if people want to get a hold of you out on the internet, how would you prefer them do that? Uh, I guess Patreon slash, uh, patreon.com slash the brothers wish. <laughs> uh, you didn't say PayPal this time. You're mixing it up. Not, uh, well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm getting busy. Actually, like three or four of these things in the list of stuff from Slack I didn't even know happened. Um, so uh, if you go there, then uh, you know, then Buzzer still gets money, and um, your problem will actually probably get answered. Well, I, I just leave it that it'll get answered because I'm busy. Uh, <laughs> very busy. All right. Very so busy. if you go to facebook.com forward slash the brothers list, that's where you find Mike. Uh, truly and honestly, that's uh, all the content that gets put up there is from Mike. Obviously, it's less than it used to be, but kids getting busy. Can't blame him for that, right? He's he's hustling out there. Yet, uh, but uh, yet, uh, I just noticed this morning. I think there was like three or four messages that were like from like three weeks ago, or like links of things. I was like, oh, I <laughs> I, guess I never saw that. Let's look at this link. Oh, that's interesting. Let's share that out. All right, good deal, good deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So keep that stuff coming. If you're uh. Uh, old school and you want to get a hold of us, you can also hit us, contact us at uh, thebrotherswist.com. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, I'm at uh, greg at gregsoul.com. I have that blog where I very occasionally post things. Um, do a little bit of consulting here or there. Uh, I've been pretty busy lately, so I uh, pick and choose, so no offense. Um, 
but I do know some people, so I'm happy to pass you over. Even if you uh, have something that's not in my wheelhouse or I don't have time for, I'll be happy to pass you over to somebody who does. Uh, but as Mike said, this Slack has been a godsend for me because uh, I have more than just these uh, six or seven idiots to ask questions to. Now I have like 70 idiots I can ask questions to. And in the collective, <laughs> we are probably an average human being. So it's pretty great. Um, lots of different channels. So lots of good discourse. Uh, questions do get answered pretty quick. You don't always get, uh, you know, like the definitive clear cut. Here is the exact answer. But a lot of times, you know, it's try this, try this, try this, try this. And in the course of those things, you know, you, you get to what you need. And uh, I am learning stuff constantly. Um, sure. I know that some guys in there are kind of lurkers, which is fine. Um, but uh, nobody's going to bite anybody in there, you know. We're not going to go to your house and uh, kill your dog if you say something dumb in there. Uh, so Get, uh, I actually, I actually just saw like an hour ago uh, a, a pet smart. I'm not sure where it was, uh, but at a pet smart store, this guy <laughs> asked to pet this elderly couple's dog and then just stabbed it. Oh my god! I was like, <laughs> what? Huh. That's. Yeah, that doesn't happen in this lecture. Just say, well, you weren't there. You don't know what the dog said. I, I don't. I didn't even read the article. I was like, that's disturbing. Yeah, Move on. That's pretty crazy. Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, mom, do you have any ideas what you're going to do your presentation on yet? No, I haven't even thought about it. Uh, honestly, that mom presentation when I saw the or not presentation the announcement, it made me think. Oh yeah, I uh, I got to figure out something to talk about. I usually try and go um, kind of uh, newbie and then more detailed and then newbie and then more detailed, you know, like one year after the other. I can't remember what I did last year, so I'll have to look. It's probably more detailed this year is what I'm going to go for. Yet, uh, I think uh, I think Wilson is going to do his on uh, um, internet exchanges, like what they are and then what micro configurations you do, you know, you know, go over local pref and med and, you know, what sort of firewall changes you have to make to, you know, and, you know, stuff like that to bring in, you know, obviously some of the IX stuff, but then you kind of, you know, bring it into Microtech, you know, what sort of custom things you have to do there yeah, for sure. to take advantage of it. Well, I guess while we're at it, if anybody has any suggestions on topics to cover, uh, throw them out there. You know, I... I'm always looking for security <laughs> security <laughs> micro tech security by obscurity uh, i think thomas was talking about doing a maybe doing a security based one and if thomas is doing one i don't have any business getting anywhere near it because he's gonna you know he's gonna murder it so i would just be wasting yeah. my time i'd be wasting everybody else's time uh in that instant but um yeah uh join the slack it's patreon.com forward slash the brothers wisps get in there add your voice to the chorus uh you know, building a great community. Want you guys to be part of it. Um, other than that, questions, comments, um, brothers wisp at uh, no contact us at the brothers wisp.com, facebook.com forward slash the brothers wisp. See you guys later. Wireless networking. We talk about equipment and methodology. So sit back and start learning. Lighting up the tower so people can start searching. Shooting up the web and neighborhoods, net surfing. We got horrible jokes. We're loud and annoying. But we're informative facts. We're not disappointing. Just give us a listen. Cause fun is the mission. I'm telling you, you don't know what you are missing. Ideas and some good comedy given. If you missed the show already, don't worry, you're forgiven.